I've seen them, the tapestries in the Met Cloisters in Upper Manhattan. It's a strange place, perched on a hill at the top of the island. It looks like a medieval monastery, but it was built in the 20th century from a hodgepodge of ruined chapels and churches transplanted from Italy and France by a very rich man. A truly American aberration of history, Frankenstein to fantasy. In truth, they disappointed me. The tapestries, I mean. They didn't pop like they do in photographs. Perhaps because they're kept in lowish light to preserve the dyes. It cost $20 to look at them, and there were so very many people looking at them. The last one in particular, with the unicorn in the pen, soaking it in as proof of the fantasy of ye old Europe as somehow refined before it was spoilt by the rabble, by the mob, by the hordes, swarms and floods of us. They should have been burnt. They will only ever be an instrument of social control, simmering with the morals of the Yanchon regime, perpetuating the image of their sophistication and shoring up their morals, uh, and shoring up their sovereign power, fixing their redundant heads to their necks. But they weren't Burnt. Instead, some reactionary thought they should have been saved, so they cut out the sections in the corners where the royal arms of Anne and Louis decorated the sky. Without their aristocratic insignia, they were spared by the mob who looted the Chateau de Verte in 1793. Spared as mere trifles, pretty fairy tale pictures. It was me who cut out the royal arms, and I'm no reactionary. I hate them too. I scowl at those who call them beautiful. Who cares if they were, took 30 years to weave? Oh my, what craftsmanship, what detail, what skill. Ha! You see hundreds of hands dancing across the loom, but detached from the wrists, arms, hearts, and minds of the people that articulated their fingers. Where among these flowers are their calluses? Where are their sore backs? Where are their nearsighted squints? They spent 30 odd years bent double over the loom, sweating and bleeding into the warp and the weft. But they're all erased like a misplaced. Godric interrupts Bilbo here to ask some questions. Who are you? Where are you? What are you talking about? Can you give us some context, please? Context? I am my own context, for I have broken free of its need. I have a voice, don't I? And a mind and a will of my own. Well, you share a body with me. Th though our legs are distinct, we have more hands than we might have. And it's unclear whether I'm in front of or behind the torso that my head seems to belong to. And yours might be superimposed, taped on like a mask. Godric adds that their voices are also very similar, almost identical. Quiet! I was mid-soliloquy. Where was I? Ah, yes. But they were all erased, like a misplaced line on a charcoal underdrawing, cut up and burnt for kindling, like the cartoons which guided their labors. 
how might they be honored? How might their labors be marked? Not in monument, the erect language of imperialism, but in gesture, in operation, in profanation. It was me who proposed to use them to cover potatoes or to protect fruit trees from frost in winter. Their me floor, thousand flower motifs, images of impossible abundance would be liberated from mere figuration and put to use toward the real and concrete achievement of plenty, toward the production of food for the people on land expropriated from the rich. Vandals, both. And I do not speak from a position of objectivity. I speak from a position of pure subjective pleasure. I just like the colors and the form and the frippery of it all. Gorgeous, gorgeous tapestries. I have no truck with the meaning of its history or its position in the canon. I'm merely looking at it. I'm looking at the striped tights, tight on thigh, the hand on the horn, the fingers parting folds, the unicorn penetrating and penetrating. There's a theory that it might have been a bedspread, you know. Imagine soiling something like that with bodily fluids. Would that not be a better way to honor the girls' towns that made it? They too fucked, remember, and dreamed of fucking more than they might have had they not been compelled to work. Godric interjects again, trying a different tact. By means of setting an example, he tells us who he is where he is, and what he is talking about. Godric explains that he is named after Godric the Grafted from Elden Ring, the latest PlayStation game in the Soulsborne series. Godric the Grafted's power is derived from the arms, heads, and legs of the soldiers slash followers that have volunteered their bodies to be grafted onto the body of Godric. Like Godric the Grafted, this Godric has also been made from parts, including two figures from Durer's Two Peasants Dancing, the head of Theoden possessed by Wormtongue, some arms, legs, and torsos from one of the unicorn tapestries which the other two figures are discussing. Where he is, is here, and what he is talking about is this thing that is unfolding before you which he struggles to understand. God, what color, what detail. I saw the tapestries and I fell into their surface. I was engulfed by them. I know well the underside of luxury is exclusion and I inhale its sickly funk, an ambergris cuffed up by history, worth more than its weight in gold, a rare excrescence. Godric interrupts here again, saying something else unrela unrelated to the devil's speech. He is ignored, and so starts speaking to himself. He wonders about his lack of voice. It's curious. He exists only in the third person, as a strange mixture of directions and script notes. Enough of your senseless babbling. You keep pulling me out of the surface. A thought illuminates Godric's mind, a spark from the rubbing together of two Wikipedia articles. He knows about the difference between a tapestry and a cartoon, and it seems the devil is confusing the two. He tries to explain to the devil clearly what a cartoon is, a one-to-one -one scale working drawing made for the production of a tapestry. 
large cartoons would be made by gluing many small sheets of paper together, which would then be drawn on and painted over. Sections could be cut out and repositioned to achieve the right composition before the finished cartoon was hung just behind the loom to be used by weavers as a visual guide for the tapestry. I know of the blood, sweat and tears absorbed, absorbed by the warp and the wef weft, and I feel them as an erotic bristle. Godric explains that cartoons only later came to mean an image or series of images intended for satire, caricature, or humor, or a motion picture that relies on a sequence of illustrations for its animation. Godric goes on to explain that connections can be made between the original meaning of cartoon and the contemporary meaning of cartoon by looking at the way his body is composited. It is a collage made up of drawn elements on paper, attached together with tape. The tape suggests a mobility of parts. It suggests movement or animation. These jumped up rugs hung on walls are like super yachts. Massive repositories of unfathomable surplus wealth. And I live happily in its hull like a ship rat, growing fat from the parasited sumptuousness of its extravagance. Godric becomes excited about how different this is from a tapestry, which is fixed, preserved, mortified. Godric also muses on the term working drawing. For whom is the drawing working? For whom is he working? He is working. He is working something out. Shut up. I'm not here to work anything out. I'm here to live deliciously. <laughs> the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom, and I'm going to fill the palace of wisdom with cum. <laughs> you speak of excess as though it has nothing to do with life as though our aims are merely practical. But whilst you luxuriate in excess, we fight for it. All emancipatory struggles are struggles for excess, for more than need, more time than you need, more food than you need, more space than you need. Indeed, they are struggles against the very idea of need, as it is constructed by our masters and constricted by them squeezing out our breathing space in increments. We fight for the universal flourishing of potential. We fight for life, which only ever floweth over. Life as an engorgement of the future. I hold the banner of Frankenhausen, emblazoned with a rainbow and the eye of Mordor. We marched under it as followers of Thomas Munzer toward the end of the German Peasant War in 1525. The Prince's troops betrayed us by breaking the ceasefire and massacred some 7,000 of our number. Godric interjects, pointing out that they both look like Frodo and Bilbo. Frodo, after he's been stung by the big spider, and Bilbo in that scene where he lunges for the ring and transforms into something like Gollum for an instant. No, we hate Lord of the Rings. Did you know that the fascist prime minister of Italy regards, regards it as a religious text? Do you know how popular it is with ghoulish Silicon Valley venture capitalists? Did you know that Tolkien rejected Stuart Hall as a, graduate, as a grad student who was interested in the Middle Ages? 
Did you know that the conflation of race and species that still ripples through the fantasy genre began with Lord of the Rings? And before you say, Tolkien hated Hitler and apartheid, etc., etc., maybe you should just look at what's happening in the books. The elves are clearly fascists, haughty, blank, and aloof. The dwarves, xenophobic hoarders of gold and precious minerals. Gandalf is an Etonian spook. He has eyes everywhere. Drones, palantirs, big eagles, occult information technologies so advanced that they're confused for magic. <coughs> and finally, the hobbits. The hobbits are home county Tories. Mealy-mouthed grocers' children, shopkeepers and milk snatchers with notions above their means. But we have both defected and fight under the banner of Sauron with hammer, sickle, scissors, and tape. The other orcs make fun of our received pronunciation, but we take it on the chin. I love that kind of warped security fencing stuff around your neck, Bilbo. It's like a rough. I love how the matte galvanized surface has been rendered in silver ink and hard graphite pencil. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, from a, a drawing of a collage I made for something else. I, uh, I like your outfit too. Isn't it remarkable? how the gold brocade is rendered, and the red velvet. It's all totally 2D, but you can almost feel the distinctive pile under your fingertips. Come to think of it, the areas of historical damage and repair do hold a certain attraction. I like how in some areas, botched repairs have meant that faces and bodies are altered or the weave is bunched up into topologies or mounds and recesses. Protrusions like swollen groins and holes. It's through such holes we enter this scene, exploiting them as portals between history and fantasy, bursting forth to declare the distinction between the two as always already defunct. What joy to rub up against the surface of history, a kind of time traveler's frottage. And before you jump in, Godric, I'm well aware that, the car that I'm a cartoon and not a tapestry. But don't underestimate the time and labor poured into my rendering. In one of my hands, I hold a power ball, a gyroscopic exercise tool which is good for joint pain. It was recommended to me by a man called Patrice. He was a professional horn player before he developed an incurative, incurable repetitive strain injury in his hand, which ended his career tragically. But he retrained as a physio, specializing in the hand. I went because my hand was in pain. I'd been drawing almost every day for eight months and getting occasional pains in my knuckles and thumb. He examined me and found no signs of permanent damage, which quite honestly disappointed me. He showed me a series of stretches and said I should take regular breaks. Some people have no respect for the morbid excitation of jouissance. Drawing gives me pleasure, you see, and the aching hand is an imprint of that pleasure. When I'm making a drawing, time bends around the task. Pleasure here is only nameable in retrospect. As language falls away in the wake of marks being made in relation to each other. If the thing being drawn is from observation, there's also a feeling of tension made up of concentrated looking which flits between the page and the thing being drawn. There's also a kind of looking at looking 
an interior surveilling eye, willing the drawing to work. This eye is also a voice. And if this eye slash voice approves of what it sees, it turns inside out. It turns into a chorus of congratulations and approval. And it has megalomaniacal tendencies. Sometimes it tells me I'm the best artist in the world. Godric points out that no one has really mentioned the unicorn, which is the subject of the series of tapestries that both characters keep referring to. We don't care about the unicorn. The unicorn didn't exist. <coughs> Godric says the unicorn did exist insofar as as it had real and measurable effects in the world. Whole economies were constructed around the sale of its horn as medicine, as talisman, and as aphrodisiac. The throne of the King of Denmark was made of it. It was narwhal tusk, yes, but it was and remains unicorn horn through the delightful suspension of this fact. Who cares? No one cares. The unicorn is so ubiquitous now, it's everywhere. It's toys, cakes, pencil cases, dildos, painkillers, guns, infinite commodities bear its image in a banal echo of the industry built around its horn. A horn that doesn't exist. A horn which is both present and absent. It protrudes into fantasy and retracts under scrutiny. It's an adolescent boy with an innocent erection. It's desire. It's libido, it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, lured by a virgin that puts its head in her lap. The power that you can't ever have, like a rainbow evaporating as you move toward it. The unicorn is an excuse. All it's good for is as an excuse, a license, an alibi, a yarn spun, a tall tale a means to be released from obligation or duty. License is freedom to act, but freedom beyond that freedom is lic licentiousness. Freedom in excess of itself, freedom spilleth over. Godric pauses in thought and then begins to say something considered and self-assured. It's a sentence neat enough to signal the start of a conclusion, a synthesis of the two positions he has been herding toward clarity. But halfway through the second sentence, he loses his train of thought. He stops, quickly collects himself, and starts again from the beginning. But when he gets to the part where he broke off, his mind goes blank. He searches for words, but none arrive. He feels himself pinned to the spot by an expectant gaze, and under its scrutiny, he begins to unravel. He hears his heartbeat and his breath. Both are too fast. Their rhythm swallows his surroundings, and his eyes, his eyes feel hot in their sockets. Then, slowly, the substance of things starts to drain away. Not the adrenaline, which remains, but most of everything else. The third spatial axis falls away. Volume dissipates. Mass vanishes, leaving only two dimensions. It all feels so insubstantial, as thin as paper. <laughs> <laughs> 